Welcome to the Private Practice Startup Podcast, where we help mental health professionals grow their dream practices and live a life they love. We chat with successful private practitioners, business coaches, and marketing experts, bringing you tons of practice building tips. We invite you to take advantage of our private practice paperwork and our signature marketing e-course. And we have a gift for you. This is the exact methodology we use to create our six-figure private pay practices and have helped many other therapists do the same. Go to privatepracticestartup.com and on the home page, click the button to download a free copy of your dream private practice playbook. Now on to today's episode. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Private Practice Startup Podcast. We hope that you go, you guys, you all joined us last week. I don't know who's wise, but anyways, I hope you're wise. <laughs> anyway, um, we hope you joined us last week as we got to interview Dr. Heather Cole on her success story and where she is now. Kate and I really just love those. It's a great time for us to catch up and really find out where our past coaching and alumni are, you know, how they're succeeding with their practice and in life, and really some of the amazing things that they're up to. So she shares tidbits on what's worked for her in private practice, but also what she's up to, um, including a nonprofit that she's had for several years. So it was great to catch up with Heather, and we hope that you join us um, on that podcast if you didn't listen to it yet. Today, um, we are interviewing Dr. Shante Deloach, um, and we're talking about the four ways to navigate shared trauma with your clients. So Dr. Shante is a licensed psychologist in California and Illinois. She maintains a boutique clinical and consulting practice in Los Angeles, California, where she specializes in trauma and couples therapy. Shante also serves as department chair and professor of psychology at Santa Monica College. She's the author of How We Practice Therapy Now, published by W.W. Norton. So we're going to be diving into that today. But before we do, let's just take a quick moment for our sponsor. If you're a private practice owner, this is for you. Running a business is just plain hard. Endless to-do list, employees to take care of, and your ever-present bottom line. So first of all, kudos to you for staying on top of it. I want to tell you about Gusto. Gusto built an easier and more affordable way to manage payroll, benefits, and more. They help over 100,000 businesses with tasks like automated payroll tax filing, Simple direct deposits, free health insurance administration, 401ks, onboarding tools, you name it, Gusto made it easy. And they really care about the small business owners they work with. Their support team is attentive and helpful. And since money can be tight right now, you'll even get three months free once you run your first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash PPS and start setting up your business today. You'll see what I mean when I say easy. Again, there's that three months free. Go to gusto.com slash PPS. Shantae, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning. It's good to be here with you all. It's even it's even much more morning over there on the uh, West Coast. We're at, we're at eleven. We're we're pushing lunch, and you're still in the morning time. So. Yes, yes. Bright and early. <laughs> So we were really excited about this topic. I know a lot of times Kate and I, you know, we're focusing on the building of practice, but sometimes we need to take a step back and really focus on the clinical aspect of practice because it is really, it's kind of hand in hand. Um, So we would always, we always love to just kind of start off with your story, either how did you get into therapy? How did you get into this topic? So share Mm -hmm. with us. Yeah. You know, like everybody, it was not a linear path. I think I took a a course in high school and it really impacted me. It touched me. It really shifted the way that I think and um, gave me a new lens uh, to really look at, think about the people around me, but also just the world. And so I majored in psychology, um, but it was really taking more classes, delving deeper um, into psychology, sociology, mental health in general, um, that allowed me to really fall in love with a psychological lens for really trying to better understand um, what was happening around me. And in terms of like coming into the practice of therapy um, in general, I I really wanted a career where I could be me, right? Like just all of me and bring my whole self um, to work every day. Um, 
And I wanted a career that allowed me to really live at the intersection of science and education and the healing arts. And, you know, I'm not a multi-talented person, so I'm glad this worked out for me. Um, But therapy really was a great um, fit in terms of all of those different things. And so I'm, I'm, I feel really fortunate that I'm able to embody all of those things and bring all of me to work every day. That's awesome. And you were kind of saying, you know, when you were making the decision, you wanted to understand the things that were going around you share with us, maybe what was happening at that time for you that you needed to make sense of. Yeah, well, part of it is just like development, right? Like, you know, I've always been an introvert. I've been shy. I uh, was developing, coming out of my shell in some ways, not in others, but also recognizing the differences among people. I've lived in a lot of different places. And so cultural differences, regional differences, family differences, like that's a whole other show, right? <laughs> like, just to go <laughs> that, I feel like that's a lifelong journey. <laughs> exactly. That could be a lifelong podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. And so really just trying to understand and, and from a strengths-based perspective, right? Like not just trying to diagnose like what's wrong with these people. Why are they not like <laughs> me? Rather, why and how are we the way that we are? And what do we do with that? Like, how do we leverage and maximize um, our strengths? And how do I navigate all of these different spaces and still be me, right? Mm -hmm. And be okay, um, even happy, even glad. Imagine that, um, (laughs) to be me. Nice. And so were you always interested in kind of like the psychological perspective? Like, were you headed that way or did you, were you in a completely different direction before that? You know, when I was early, I had, you know, dreams of the arts, dreams of, you know, financially lucrative law career, retire by 30. Clearly that didn't happen. (laughs) But also like those fields didn't necessarily speak to my heart in the same way and like my interior space. Um, And honestly, like I said, I I do feel like the artistic side of me um, gets to also live and thrive um, in the therapy Mm -hmm. space. It is improv every day. It is, you know, being able to be creative in the work that I do. And so I really enjoy that as well. Tell us a little bit about your journey into private practice, how long you've been in private practice, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I started my private practice just surprisingly. Like I was new to (laughs) Chicago. I had moved to Chicago in 2005 for a faculty position. And um, one of the requirements of the faculty position was that we all practice in some way. We were training doctoral clinicians and I thought it was a great idea. Yes, I'm training doctoral clinicians. I should also be practicing. And so I was newly licensed, but because I was new to the city, I didn't want to um, get another job in community mental health. Um, I had conversations with folks who were in both um, soul independent practice as well as group practices. And I just kind of decided on a whim, well, hmm, maybe I'll do my own thing. Like, that sounds like a good idea. And so thankfully, (laughs) it worked out. But I had a lot of support and mentorship of um, the therapist in Chicago who just really answered questions for me. And so I started small in part because I was new to the city and because I didn't want to um, practice full time at the time. And so surprisingly, like I had my first client before I had a website. I didn't have like my phone number set up. I was just in conversations with people like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. And this is what I do and why. And that really resonated with people. And so, um, yeah, so I started in Chicago. I'm remain licensed in Illinois. Um, and so even when I returned back to California, um, I had a similar approach to my practice. I really wanted my practice to be in alignment with who I am, uh, how I am, and the clients and uh, populations that I want to serve most. Nice. Beautiful. Had you always wanted to work with trauma or did you kind of find your way into that as well? (sighs) Um, no, I never thought I was going to specialize in trauma or couples for that matter, but you know, trauma is 
like period, right? Like it just is, it is very present. And I felt the weight of it. Um, and I went on to do some additional postdoctoral training and that kind of thing. And so um, that really helped me to think more expansively about the types of trauma, the range of trauma um, that I see and work with in my practice from, you know, childhood kinds of um, abuses that we survive to race-based traumas, to immigration um, related traumas. And so, uh, yeah, I see folks who often have experienced multiple um, traumas and, um, yeah, it just became a passion, but also it was very prevalent in the populations and the communities um, where I was working. Nice. Let's just take a quick moment for our sponsor. Is managing your practice stressing you out? Try Therapy Notes. It makes billing, notes, scheduling, and telehealth a whole lot easier. Check it out and you will quickly see why it's rated the highest EHR on Trustpilot with over 1,000 verified customer reviews and an average customer rating of 4.9 or 5 stars. You'll notice the difference from the first day you sign up for the trial. They offer live phone support seven days a week. So when you have questions, you can quickly reach someone who can help. You are never wasting time looking for answers. If you're coming from another EHR, they make the transition really easy. Therapy Notes will import your client's demographic data free of charge during your trial so you can get going right away. Use the promo code PPS to get your first two months for free or try out Therapy Notes for free, no strings attached, including their very reliable telehealth platform. Make 2021 the best year yet with Therapy Notes. As a therapist, you're probably too preoccupied with your caseload to think about bookkeeping or tax filing. Herd is a bookkeeping and tax platform built specifically for therapists that helps you track and improve your practice's financial health. Regardless of whether you're a seasoned clinician or in the first year of your practice, Herd will help you identify areas for growth and streamline best financial practices for your business. When you sign up, you'll work directly with financial specialists to track your income and expenses, file taxes online, and grow your business. You'll also receive financial insights such as profit and loss statements and personalized monthly reports. Say goodbye to reviewing spreadsheets and guessing your tax deductions or quarterly payments. Focus on your clients and HERD will take care of the rest. Dr. Katia, a psychologist based in San Francisco, says, Working with HERD freed up my time to focus on what really matters in my practice. Managing my books is now easy, transparent, and cost-effective. Plans begin at $75 per month and can easily be tailored to fit your business's financial needs. Schedule your first consultation at joinherd.com. That's joinherd.com. Shante, let's dive into being able to navigate shared trauma with clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first, you know, shared trauma may not be a term that a lot of folks are familiar with. When we talk about shared trauma, we're talking about uh, times when therapists experience um, and clients, therapists and clients share direct exposure at the same time to the same trauma, right? And this can be uh, any kind of trauma, right? But oftentimes it refers to more collective events, right? It can be a crisis. Um, it can be obviously the pandemic or related and all of the related kinds of issues. But what's particularly uh, unique about shared trauma for therapists is that in addition to our own direct exposure um, to the trauma, we're also having this double exposure because we are also being exposed indirectly through our sessions with clients. And, you know, this is, this doesn't happen um, a lot, meaning that oftentimes when there is a collective trauma of some type, we bring in outside therapists, right? So if there's a mass shooting, if there's a disaster of some type, um, we bring in external therapists to help take care of the community, including those therapists or other healthcare providers. Yet what we know is that during the pandemic, We didn't have that as a luxury, as a privilege. We were all in it together and still are Mm -hmm. um, alongside our clients. And so 
that can have a whole lot of different effects um, that can be really challenging um, for us in terms of the work that we do, um, be challenging for us personally, but it can also have some um, positive benefits as well in the work that we do. I'll talk about that. I'm curious. <clears throat> yeah. So one, you know, I think the the challenges uh, many of us may be very aware of, and we may have felt and experienced over the past uh, almost two years. So first, you know, those of us who came into the pandemic with our own prior histories of trauma, which is, you know, a good number of us, we may um, have be at more at risk for being more negatively affected from anxiety to depression to having PTSD-like symptoms. Um, we may be conflicted between our commitment to our clients in our own personal lives or our familial kinds of issues. We may uh, have difficulty fully attending to clients in um, our sessions or just being fully present or just separating our stuff from theirs when in a session they're talking about things and we're nodding like, yes, yes, I, I get it. I've been there. I'm in that myself. Um, and so it might affect our clinical decision making in ways that are unfamiliar. Um, and it also makes sense then that during times of shared trauma that as therapists, we can lose our confidence in our clinical abilities, the effectiveness of our work. We might find ourselves just bringing what we're doing into question, you know, like find ourselves thinking about it after sessions, like, ooh, did I handle that um, in the best way? Um, because we may have an awareness that, um, we weren't fully present or that we were being triggered more than usual. Um, some of us may have had increased clinical loads. We may have felt the emotional exhaustion, compassion fatigue, be at risk for burnout. Um, but on the positive side, it can lead to greater emotional intimacy with our clients because we're able to access that emotional empathy because we get it, right? Like we're in it with them. Um, we understand the juggles of everything, potential losses, fear, uncertainty. And so that can strengthen our therapeutic alliance with some clients. For many of us, it may have heightened our sense of commitment to our work, um, but it can also just lead to personal and professional growth, just knowing that we're able to navigate um, this time and juggle, manage our own personal stuff and hold space for our clients. And so I think there have been a lot of lessons learned over the past um, year and a half for many of us. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about some, for you personally, um, yeah. being a trauma therapist with the various traumas, especially in this last year and a half, mm -hmm. what, what ways have you grown and what awarenesses have you had? Yeah. One of the, I, I share with, um, a lot of clients, um, that I see and, you know, I have this on my website. I have a, a daughter who is medically vulnerable. She was a little preemie. And so, um, she's got a number of, uh, health issues, but specifically breathing <laughs> kinds of stuff. And so there's been just a lot of fear, um, over and uncertainty over the past year and a half still is because she can't, um, be vaccinated, but, um, that has led to a lot of restrictions um, for us as a household as a way of protecting her, um, doing what was within our power, within our control. And that came with its consequences. That's emotionally exhausting. It's draining. Um, and so I can absolutely relate to clients who have similar concerns, who have fears, not just for children, but for elders, for loved ones, people who may have made a lot of sacrifices and not traveled or seen many people or that kind of thing as a result of um, health concerns for themselves or for loved ones. Uh, and because my clients know this um, about me and about my situation, they, I think, have empathy for me, but also um, they know that um, I have concern around that and I'm able to, um, that I'm in that with them. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit of, it, it's very challenging, you know, what mm -hmm. you share and, and it's amazing that you've been able to 
disclose that in a way mm-hmm. that it's been therapeutically useful and for yes. so many clinicians as they're in it and going through this shared trauma. And mm-hmm. we're using the pandemic as an example because everyone can relate to that on yes. some level or not, mm-hmm. or some level or another. How did you uh, manage to disclose that in a way that's therapeutically useful, but mm-hmm. you know, balance it so it's not too much disclosure? Yeah. So how do you navigate mm-hmm. that aspect? Yeah. I mean, one, I think boundaries, right? Like understanding what I disclose needs to always be in the best interest of the client, mm-hmm. right? And just not about me needing to vent mm-hmm. or me needing support in the moment. Because the truth is like most of us have needed support over the past <laughs> year in varying degrees. And some days are more difficult than others. Um, but because... Uh, the experience that I had having a child born prematurely and all of that, and do a lot of work with um, other parents and hospitals and, you know, who who experience reproductive health issues, go through adoption, you know, a whole range of kinds of things. That's something that um, I am pretty open about when Mm -hmm. that is relevant. So one of the questions is asking, is this relevant? Like, do my clients need to know this information, Mm -hmm. right? And so one of the ways that I shared was in the beginning when, you know, we were beginning to shut down and work remotely and all of that. Part of what I shared was, hey, I have some concerns about my daughter's health. And so I will not be returning to work in person until I have some um, reassurance um, about my daughter's health. So part of it was simply sharing the information that was necessary, right? Mm -hmm. I don't share the information that isn't necessarily in the better interest of um, my client. So it's always leading with what's helpful for the client Mm -hmm. and how much of this, how do I share in a way that's going to allow them to understand or get something and see me more fully, right? Like as a human being, um, yet also not tell them, well, let me tell you, I was up all night giving breathing treatments or, you know, like going into a space that clearly becomes about me. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for talking us through that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, Shante, what would you recommend? <clears throat> you know, I just, I'm thinking back to the pandemic and then a lot with the racial trauma specifically last yeah. year, not that there's not mm-hmm. always that in the background, mm-hmm. but I just remember listening to so many of our BIPOC therapists, right. And only, yeah. I can only just empathize and imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, I just would hear the the stories and them going through their own racial traumas and also yes. trying to help their clients navigate. Like mm-hmm. what advice do you have of wanting to be the helpful help helper, right? But also mm-hmm. knowing when, like, what are some of those signs that we need to pull back and maybe we aren't in that right space? Like, mm-hmm. and what do we need to do about that? Yeah. You know, those signs can look different for all of us. And so I think being attuned to ourselves and knowing what our, where our signs are, right? So, you know, for some of us, it's the eye twitch, right? For others of us, it is the, you know, am I sleeping well? Am I um, taking care of myself? What, you know, am I reaching for Oreos instead of the apple, <laughs> right? Like we may all, I may be giving myself away here. Um, <laughs> am I reaching for four and six rather than just one or two? Is that all right? I'm I'm getting some awareness here. Exactly. Right. And so like the more self-awareness we have around our own specific um, telltale signs, um, I think the more we can take better care of ourselves, even as we show up for other people. And so um, being aware, am I still taking care of myself? right? Um, In the ways that I need to take care of myself. And for many of us, especially those of us who have experienced um, our own racial traumas, in addition to holding space for more during that time, and a lot of the time, we're more likely to say yes, right? We're more likely to say yes to more people, right? Um, Or for longer times, or to say yes to that returning client, because we get it, We know that um, we want to be able to show up and hold space, yet we're also triggered. We're also trying to take care of ourselves, our family members, talk to our children about these things. And it's tough. And so um, it's really learning uh, what can I hold right now? 
right? And uh, where, where are my boundaries for myself? Because we're not called to be martyrs uh, in the process of taking care of and showing up for others. Yeah. I remember I had a client die by suicide and um, mm-hmm. I remember coming into a, the next session and, you know, Kate and I shared the same supervisor for many years. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. I don't know if I reached out to Kate. I probably reached out to a few colleagues. You did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and And I just mm-hmm. remember like, okay, like, you know, it's time to get back to work, but I was definitely affected for a good, like two, three weeks, you yes. know, and, um, it was just really helpful to share with my client at that time. Like, Hey, I just want you to know I've had a recent trauma, you know, you don't have to worry about what it is. It's okay. Yes. But I just want you to know in case maybe you catch me spacing out for a moment or yes. something like that, you know, yes. but I'm here with you. Like it, it's mm-hmm. not like mm-hmm. it's, it, it, it's relieving to just share something. So they aren't like, yes, you know, where, where are you today? You know what I mean? And yes. then it's like then reassuring them, like, I'm still mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. Yes. Um, and then obviously self-reflection on the other side, like, how did that yes. go for you? Do you need supervision? Like mm-hmm. what, what do you need? You know? Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that because sometimes when we don't share even just minimal information, we run the risk of our clients personalizing the difference mm-hmm. that they experience right. in us. Because, you know, they're especially clients who know us, right? They're used to how we ordinarily show up. They're right. used to our ordinary, our usual energy. And so even thinking in advance about what we want to share is really important. Um, similarly, I I had a, a sudden death of my father years ago. And the, you know, I took what I felt was the requisite amount of time. I wasn't okay, of course, because, you know, right. what does that mean? <laughs> but I had done the work and I was like, okay, I thought about who I was seeing, what their presenting issues were. I consulted. I did all of the right things. And I had disclosed to to clients beforehand, hey, my apologies. I have a death in my family. I'll be out, you know, for the next week. I'll follow up. What I had not expected was for someone to ask me who I lost. And I just so happened at the time I was recording some sessions, obviously with clients' permission, because I was training doctoral students. And so I happened to have this recorded. uh, And this is such a great teachable moment. The client offered her condolences and asked me, who did you lose? And that question just completely gave me pause. And this is like just this beautiful, loving, caring client right? So I was prepared for all of the other questions, but for whatever set of reasons I and the folks I consulted with had not (laughs) prepared me for the who did you lose question. And so I had to decide in real time, do I disclose that it was my father or do I deflect? How do I want to navigate that? Not just like clinically, but with this person, in front of me? And how do I provide them with a reassurance that I'm good enough, I'm well enough to be here and present and um, so on. And that's, that's so tough to um, navigate. Yeah, for sure. And I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, all my clients in clinical history. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I remember our supervisor, like, I think Kate and I kind of, this would be our go-to no matter what, like when you get kind of caught off guard would be like, well, well, how would, how would that be helpful for you to know? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm Because it's like, it's something that you can pull out right quick when you don't know what to say, Yes, you know what I mean? And then put it back over there and then you can Mm -hmm. process it later. And so it's interesting Mm -hmm. as I hear you talking about that, it almost makes sense. Like, you know, when we're doing these consultations to prepare ourselves the best for session is maybe we can ask our colleagues to role play with us and throw out some questions that folks might ask. And yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just the awareness of how we as individuals want to navigate those, right? Because we all have these theoretical differences, but we all have personality differences and boundary differences around that, right? And so um, that the answer to those questions may differ. Um, But yeah, absolutely. That consultation and supervision is absolutely important, necessary, um, in addition to our own therapy, of course, and, and emotional support in navigating these spaces. Yeah, it's really interesting as I kind of reflect, 
being in the mental health world for 20 years, right? Like looking at kind of, I feel like it was, you know, very psychodynamic and very boundary and you don't share and mm-hmm. you're the blank slate and, you know, yes. you look professional. And then as like with telehealth and the internet, and even when Kate and I first started private practice, there was still this a little bit like stuffiness around therapy. And then yes. when therapists were really embracing their authentic selves and like really having a brand and showing up in jeans or w- yes. with all their crazy fun things and colors and just mm-hmm. being themselves. Like, mm-hmm. and then we go into the pandemic where not only are clients navigating the pandemic, but you're navigating the pandemic. Yes. And the door opens, you, you forgot to lock it. They see yes. your kid. Like, you know, <laughs> yes. It's, yes. it's therapy is much more human now, yes. I think, you know what I mean? And there's a Absolutely. lot of relatability there, but then there's also a lot of places to slip into too much. You know what I mean? Yes. So an interesting transition over the last several decades. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more that the way that we have seen therapy evolve is into something that's far more human, far more relatable for so many of us and authentic. And also so many clients want a therapist that is knowable. Yes right? They yes. want to feel like this is something authentic. That doesn't mean that we are open books, right? right? And, you know, that they're our best friend, but that this is something that is authentic and that there's something that they know about us um, to connect with. And that's understandable. Um, and also, I think it has made, at least for me, therapy a lot more rewarding, Right. And, you know, I remember a hundred years ago when I was training and, you know, I had a supervisor, you know, we were recording our sessions and I remember a supervisor pausing a session and looking at me and she was like, who is this person? And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, this doesn't feel like you. And that stuck with me so much because she was like, you're funny and there's nothing you like, your personality isn't coming through in this session and with this client. Why? And so that really opened uh, our supervisory relationship to this conversation about what is it, what do, what did I think it meant to be a therapist, right? And how to more fully be myself, and be authentic with my clients. And so one of the first things I tell clients now is I use humor when that is appropriate. Like you will get come to know my personality. So whether you are in therapy with me, on the train with me, in a classroom with me, or a podcast, like at some point, you know, we're probably going to chuckle um, because that is, you know, part of my personality. Mm-hmm. Nice. Shante, you just, I've just enjoyed this conversation. I know Kate has too. It just, absolutely. It just feels so, I don't know, relaxing, therapeutic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you like our audience to most take away from your message today? I, I really have loved this conversation as well. And I think one of the most important things is what we just talked about is just that reminding ourselves that therapy remains a human enterprise, right? Like we are in a human business and it's okay to allow ourselves to be fully human and to also trust that we can still maintain those appropriate boundaries, but that sometimes we need to uh, allow clients to see us more fully, especially as we are navigating um, these shared traumas alongside our clients. And many clients appreciate that about us. And so we may find that more clients come to us and that our relationships with our existing clients may deepen um, as a result of being more authentic and being more knowable. I could not agree more with, with what you're saying. And it's just, I I know I've been taking a step back and kind of soaking it all in with this, with this episode and topic. It's just such a beautiful conversation and and I find it to be refreshing and almost liberating because you're, you're helping people give themselves permission to be themselves, to be authentic, but with boundaries, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and to be very intentional about it. And when, um, when they're having an experience of shared trauma with someone, knowing how to navigate that, to lean 
in more towards some of the positive side of things and really manage and stay on top of some of the more negative effects to Mm -hmm. not fall into that. And of course, you know, the, the different um, tips and recommendations that you gave for how to do that. So thank you so much, Shante, for being here and um, giving us this beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we know you have some resources, some of them, which we'll put on our show notes page are the self-care for social workers, self-care resources for therapists and avoiding therapist burnout. But Shante, you also have a checklist. What is that? Yeah, um, I have a free downloadable checklist on best ways to navigate shared trauma um, with our clients. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out my book where I talk about this. How do we practice therapy now? Awesome. Awesome. So grab a copy of that book. We hope you all enjoyed this episode. Um, Thank you so much, Shante, for being here. And next week, we invite Susan Horowitz and we talk about debunking the myths of networking, even if you're an introvert. So if you're an introvert and you love networking (laughs) or think you should be doing it, join us for that episode. Okay. Yeah. Startup Nation, we hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. And of course, we want to encourage you to subscribe, rate, and review the show. You can find the link to do so right on our show notes page on the website. And of course, share with your fellow colleagues and friends. We, we love to be able to get the word out and to be able to support as many private practitioners as we can across the globe from startup to mastery. So keep doing the amazing work that you're doing, making a difference in this world and know that we are here cheering you on every step along the way. We'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks again, Shate. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on The Private Practice Startup. Visit theprivatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, free trainings, attorney-approved private practice paperwork, and so much more.